features a segment from a recent Gun Talk radio episode. You can listen to all the Gun Talk radio podcasts however you tune in, or check out guntalk.com for more. We're joined right now by Shane Coley, formerly Army Marksmanship Unit shooter, a champion all the way around in speed shooting, action shooting, steel challenge, and now, of course, captain of Team Glock. Hey, Shane, how you doing? Good, sir. I am having a wonderful Sunday and uh, very appreciative to be on your show. Oh, excellent. And so I started off, and you heard me I was talking about there are a lot of people who think they're good shooters, but they just go to the range and fling bullets down range, and they don't really put any type of score, whether it's a, you know, the actual score on the target or a time on it. And I, I would offer that until you are doing that, you really have no idea how good or mediocre you are. What do you think? I, I definitely agree with that. And, you know, over the years, I've seen a lot of people, um, they make these visits to the range. They talk about how they're putting a lot of bullets down range. But the one thing that I see they lack is a purpose. You know, what is your reason for being at the range? What is, what is the skill or fundamental that you're actually trying to train on? And I think that needs to be a focus. You know, you go to the range and you pick a particular skill, fundamental, you know, what have you. And, uh, you collect all the data, whether it's your accuracy, your speed, your movement, your your times, and then you're able to you know kind of revisit all of this all of this data and build future plans. Um, but going to the range just to shoot, I don't think really benefits people as far as increasing their skill sets. Well, I would agree. I mean, it's fun. We all agree it's fun just to fling bullets down range. But it's even more fun, I think, to become a better shooter. Give me an idea of what you do you know when, when Shane Coley goes to the range to practice and you have all this training and all this experience and you say okay today I'm going to work on x what kind of a thing will fill in that x well it depends you know I begin the competition season every year with kind of a like fundamental fundamental basis because I haven't shot any competitions in a couple of months I'm a little rusty uh maybe my draws my accuracy my speed all of these things are they're not exactly where I want them to be so I usually do like a foundational rework at the beginning of each season. And then as I get into the competition season, I come home from a match and I revisit things that I did not like during the competition. Maybe my movement was slow. Uh, maybe I missed a bunch of draws. Maybe my reloads were subpar. Uh, and then I kind of developed this new plan built to, built around what I experienced at the previous match. So then, you know, say my movement is off. Well, the next couple of weeks, when I get home from you said competition, then I'm going. Mm-hmm. I'm going to spend all of my time focusing on movement, entering, exiting position, positions, shooting on the move, uh, and trying to you know get my feet faster, my entries faster. Uh, so I, I kind of build everything around the previous competition. When you do that, do you start? Do you slow things down to work on the fundamentals and then build your speed back up? I, mean, I know that's what I would have to do. But I don't know, maybe at your level, you don't have to slow it down to work on things. Uh, I, I do slow some things down, and it depends on what the skill is. And, you know, really what I try to do is, even when we, when we talk about a, a singular skill, there are still different parts to that skill. And what I'll do is I'll go in and I'll break down each piece of that skill to really figure out kind of where I'm messing up or where, uh, where the negative feedback is coming from, and then I'll, I'll focus on that. And then as I progress throughout that, I guess, that training session or that that training plan, I'll start to bring everything back together and then start applying more speed and really pushing the limits and kind of Mm -hmm. find like the the new failure point, if you will. You push it until you hit a failure point and then you find out what happened there. Correct. And I I believe in training. If you're not failing, then you're not training hard enough. Ah, well, yeah, yeah, exactly. I mean, I've, I've heard it said many times, just, you know, People say, you know, I shoot really small groups, you know, and the comeback is, that's great. Now shoot faster. Keep, keep exactly. pushing it until the groups get big and then start working on it to make them small again. Yes, I agree 100%. Let me ask you this. Obviously, uh, you're captain of Team Glock, shooting Glocks. Glock is known primarily uh, either as a duty gun or a self-defense gun. Clearly, it's been used in competition, but I'm, I'm kind of wanting to make the connection and using the the Glock platform maybe is our conversation piece is between competition shooting and people who carry concealed or have a gun for self-defense. And there are skills that you can bring from the competition side to say, look, these are at least a few things you probably ought to be working on if you carry a gun for protection. Is that something you'd like to 
to weigh in on. Sure. And, you know, one of the things that uh, one of the things I've learned from competition over my 20 years of competing is it focuses focuses on all of the fundamentals of shooting, you know, uh, grip, recoil management, side acquisition, accuracy, speed, movement, everything related to shooting. And it enhances all of it. It forces you to do everything faster and more efficiently. So as you grow in the competition world, all of the fundamental handgun skills, weapon manipulation, uh, malfunctions, everything related to shooting is all experienced inside of competition. And people get really, really good at uh, all of those things. So when you take all of those skills and then you transfer that to home defense, concealed carry, you still have all of those applicable skills. So if I ever, God forbid, find myself in a situation where I'm in a self-defense uh, scenario, I still have all of the fundamental skills and the weapons manipulation and everything that I have taken from competition, you know, at, at the ready in that scenario. Mm -hmm. So I am extremely confident in that situation as far as what I'm capable of doing. But I've also spent a lot of time like mentally preparing for how that situation might go down. So maybe there's, you know, a de-escalation tactic or a way to get out of the situation or remove myself. But ultimately the competition side you're able to focus so much on all of the skills, all of the manipulation, all of the malfunctions, everything related to shooting, and transfer all of that to everything self-defense. You always say the same things. All of you guys say the same things. You have to work on the basics. You have to be good at uh, grip and trigger press and side alignment. And I'm thinking, well, there's, surely there's some kind of a secret tip you can tell me where I don't actually have to do the work, right? <laughs> there is no secret. I have, to, I have to say there is no secret. <laughs> Darn. Then again, <laughs> what it also means is each of us can get better. We may not get to your level, but each of us can get better. And I've always submitted that the advancement you can make in pistol shooting, I think, is faster than in anything else. And maybe that's because a lot of people do it so poorly, it doesn't take a lot to get them up to a mediocre level. I don't know. But, you know, they go to somebody like you, and and you've done this thousands of times. You take somebody who's an okay shot, and in 15, 20 minutes, an hour, you'll have them shooting a lot better. Yep. Yes, sir. Absolutely. And there's, there's no, there's no real secret sauce. There's no, there's no secret way to spin it. Um, it is, there's some mental aspects to it. Uh, getting a lot of people have, you know, issues with trigger anticipation. So there's that mental block to get over that. Mm -hmm. uh, and once, once people kind of get past the anticipation, they understand grip pressure, what they're seeing visually, they learn a little bit of visual discipline. Um, and they're able to process more of what they're able to see. Uh, then you start seeing the groups tighten. You start seeing a lot of the comfortability coming in. Um, so it, it's, it's, there's no secret sauce to it, but it just takes time. It takes rounds down range, and it takes like a focused effort on, you know, whatever, whatever skill you're trying to figure out. Yeah, makes perfect sense. Okay, so let's talk Glock for a minute. Uh, for some people, they're going to say, well, you know, Glocks are duty pistols. They're defensive pistols. You know, they have quote-unquote, duty level of accuracy. In other words, they're not really that accurate. And then I see you out there competing and people competing with Glocks, and that cannot possibly be true that they're not accurate, right? Uh, they're very accurate, and they are more accurate than myself will ever be able to shoot. I can, I can <laughs> honestly say that. Wow, okay. So what make, I guess, what, either what makes them accurate, or are they more accurate now than they were, whatever it was, 40 years ago when they were introduced? Well, I believe they've always been extremely accurate, and I think uh, some people have this idea that, you know, a pistol is supposed to shoot a one-inch group at 50 or a half-inch group at 50, um, and I, I don't think that is extremely realistic, but when you have pistols that are shooting three, four inches at 50 yards, you know, out of a rest, then I would qualify that as extremely accurate, and to be completely honest, that is a level of accuracy that myself or very few people that I know can actually attain shooting a freestyle. You know, I can't, I can't stand at a 50-yard line and shoot a four-inch group. That's just not something right. that's realistically possible for me. So with the, with the firearm itself being much more accurate than I am, then I feel like that is applicable to every scenario, whether it be home defense, self-defense, competition. And I think that's, that's where we are now. It makes perfect sense. So if you will, just give us the cliff notes because – I get lost in the Gen 2, Gen 3, Gen 4, Gen 5 of Glocks. What's the progression? And are there any, like, big changes that people should be aware of of why they want the latest greatest? 
Well, the, the biggest thing with the, the changes in generations has been the shift in the market. You know, the market's always changing. The consumer needs and wants are always changing. And as all of these things change, then Glock is always going to create and innovate new products that are going to be uh, that are going to fit that, that market space for what the consumer needs and wants are. Uh, and as we've gone through generation one to now generation five, there's been there's been changes throughout all of them. We've changed uh, the uh, slide coatings, we've changed barrels, we've changed we've put front front serrations um, on the slides. We've got ambidextrous controls now. We've got no finger grooves. We have flared magwells. Uh, so we've added things that are more beneficial to the current consumers. And uh, with the latest product that we have, the Glock 47, which was you know originally developed for CBP and is now available commercially, it's kind of entered into a world of modularity for us. It's got mm-hmm. a shortened recoil system. It shares the Glock 45 frame with a Glock 17 link slide. So there's modularity between the Gen 5 Glock 19 and the Glock 45. Um, so different pistol models can be created out of the Glock, the Glock 47. But mm. it's got a different recoil feel. It's much smaller, has all of the Gen 5 features. And, uh, and yeah, like I said, with the generation and the changes, it's, all, it's, it's a lot market-based. And uh, Glock is always, always going to continue to figure out what the consumer wants and needs are and develop things that fit that. And, of course, uh, Glock has obviously adopted uh, the whole uh, optics generation. In your view, both in competition and in, well, of course, duty guns and self-defense as well, how are you seeing the move to using pistol optics? Well, that, that was, you know, the, the, the MOS or the modular optic system was something that came out uh, six or seven years ago for us. And mm-hmm. as we've gotten further, you know, further along now, the, the industry itself has gone way more in the direction of optics. Pistol optics, pistol optics are now, in my eyes, kind of becoming like a standard, whether it be law enforcement or military or even competition. You know, I look at the competition world for us, and we have two new divisions now that are strictly pistol optics, and they are completely exploding with competitors. Um, so the industry is going that direction. Like I said, it's becoming a standard, and I think that is going to be partly the future of what the industry will turn into because the optics make shooting, I wouldn't say easier, uh, but they make it simpler, if, if that makes more sense. It, it does. I mean... Having spent a lifetime trying to get people to understand rear sight, front sight, target, and where am I going to focus? Focus, you know, focus on the front sight. Let the target blur out, which is kind of a Zen thing where people say, "Well, I can't possibly hit a target if I'm not actually hardly fo- hard focused on it." And now you just go, <laughs> just, "Just, just put the dot on the target, press the trigger." People get that. Right, right, and it does simplify a lot of things. Uh, and I mean, the other side with the optic too that I've seen is because it shows you so much more. Uh, I've also seen people struggle with that in that regard because uh, you're able to see, you know, every aspect of recoil, where the dot goes, how it, how the dot itself tracks, um, and that's that's kind of another, you know, you're talking about uh, front sight focus, rear sight, blurred target. Well, that's that idea with the optics is kind of the same. It's a different argument, but similar argument. Uh, trying to get people to navigate that, where because they can see so much more, they're trying to force more things to happen. As opposed oh, yes. to just letting the gun do its own thing. Well, yes, and it's that old deal of you're not going to get the dot to stop moving. And if you try Correct. to basically yank the trigger at the perfect time when the dot's drifting through the target, you'll simply yank the trigger as opposed to just pressing it and letting – you have to kind of embrace the wobble, don't you? Right, you do. And one thing I've done is I've asked – I've asked people to like just aim at a target. Say we're at 10 yards. I just have them aim at a target and show me where the dot is wiggling, you know, kind of around the target. And then I'll mm-hmm. walk down range and I'll basically draw that on the target as best I can from what, you know, from what they explained to me. But it's, right. it's like a visual reference for them so that they can actually see the movement on the target. And what it, at 10 yards, what it generally turns out to be is like a two to three inch area that the dot is actually moving through. So when you draw that out and they're able to see what their group would look like, it's very small. So then when they see the movement at 10 yards of the optic, it doesn't seem like it's that big of a deal anymore, but it's, it's giving them that like frame of reference that, okay, my dot is moving. I don't like this, but in reality, it's only moving a couple of inches on the target. So I'm still going to be extremely accurate. Well, I'm just going to say, and you say, look, and you would be happy with a hit in any of these areas where the dot's moving. So quit worrying about it. Exactly. Absolutely. As long as you're maintaining that center of mass hit, then, I mean, you're being successful. Interesting. I like that because I've, 
I tried to explain to people, look, don't worry about it. The wobble's okay, but that's a great idea. Just look, all right, where's it moving? How much is it moving? And go down there and draw and say, would you be happy with any of these hits? Well, yes. Okay, well then just don't try to make it perfect because that's how you end up yanking it off a target. Right. Yes, sir. Absolutely agree. Son of a gun. So what's new for Glock? What can we expect? I mean, it's like, have we reached the pinnacle and there's nothing more to do? No, I would never say that we've reached the pinnacle. Uh, there's always, you know, we're always working on new things. There's always new things in the pipeline. Uh, the future is always bright for us. And uh, right now we've, we're focusing a lot on uh, Glock 47, the MOS products. We have uh, the G20 and the G21 Gen 5, which are the 10 millimeter and the 45 auto. Um, so those are kind of launched at SHOT Show this year. They've kind of been the focus uh, of this year. But as mm -hmm. far as what's new, the future will always hold what's new for us. And I can promise that the future will be very bright for everybody. And you're not going to tell us. That's the way it is. <laughs> <laughs> well, I have to That's be okay. some out there so that you, you, you get excited for all this stuff. Oh, exactly right. Well, look, I really appreciate you spending time with us. Uh, it's just it's fun to have uh, good shooters like you offering their tips and their experience. And as I say, and what it ends up being, of course, is we end up going back to almost the same things with each of us, which tells me that there really are some fundamentals that people can work on. Yes, sir. The fundamentals, is, it's like... You know, I've referenced Mr. Miyagi in the past, the whole wipe on, wipe off thing, and it's all the fundamental aspects of shooting. Uh, and as long as you master those fundamentals, then the the level of skill that you can achieve is almost endless. And to me, that's a fascinating thought that there really is no, like, top level, this is as good as somebody can get. It's kind of an endless, an infinite number. So that makes training fun because there's always more to improve. There you go. Shane Kelly, thank you so much. I appreciate your time. You're welcome back here anytime. I appreciate, appreciate you, Tom. Thank you. All right. You take care. That was fun. I um, I got a new holster because <laughs> I'm, I hate to admit it, I'm not going to admit it, which is a shame, but I'm trying my hand at Steel Challenge. Our little local club is doing that. I, I mentioned that. So I got a new holster for 1911 and I'm practicing draws with it. And what I'm finding, and it goes right back to what he was talking about, is one of the things he mentioned was getting your grip, is that if I try to go too fast, I don't get a good firing grip on a 1911. I don't pr uh, press down, compress the grip safety. And I come up and I'm trying to get a uh, dry fire press and nothing happens because I haven't compressed the grip safety. So now it's a case of just dry fire practice, slowing it down, making sure I get a good grip, you know, a good firing grip on the gun before it comes out of the holster. You wanna have that firing grip before the gun comes out of the holster.